All right, so here in Texas, pronunciation is very important, especially when you're tripping. Let me give you some examples. Let's say you want to go to a place called Nevada. Well, you will be headed out of state. But if you want to go to a spot called Nevada, well, you'll just be headed outside of Dallas. Want to go to Iran? Well, you'll be hopping on one serious plane flight. But if you want to go to Iran, well, you're just hopping out to West Texas. And if you want to go to a place called Palestine, well, you'll be setting yourself in the Middle East. But our destination today is just going to take us to the middle of East Texas. Palestine! Ah! Is he dead? Yeah. Are you alive? This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. We could probably still do the show without him, I think. Barbecue! Where am I? Oh yeah, Palestine. All right, let's go! He's alive, everybody, he's alive. Palestine, well, wait, uh, Steen, sits in East Texas. It's about an hour 45 southeast of Dallas and just about an hour south of Tyler. Trees, lakes, and rolling hills make it a drive very different from the Middle East. But it will land you in the middle of a town that really epitomizes the eastern side of the Lone Star State. One thing that I love so much about traveling Texas is that, you know, the mountain towns of West Texas feel totally different than sort of the woodsy towns of East Texas. Something with the trees and the architecture. I like Palestine. You've got this sense of soul and legacy. It's true, and some of Texas's deepest roots are buried in the East Texas soil. You know, Palestine itself goes back to 1846 when it was created for the sole purpose of being the county seat of Anderson County. You see, there wasn't any other city in the center of the county, so they made one up, and the world got Palestine. The Anderson County Courthouse is well worth a visit, if only to admire its grand staircase and famed Texas floor mural. But to really get schooled on Palestine's story past, well, we're headed to the Museum for East Texas Cultures, whose largest artifact is really its building, as it's housed in the old Palestine High School. Oh, now this is cool. All the exhibits are actually inside of the old classrooms. And this one is all about the railroad. Man. This is a completely scale model of Palestine, obviously, with the uh, Palestinian mountains right here. Palestine's story is similar to many other Texas towns. It was a small farming community just bobbing along, but then the railroad came to town, bringing change faster than a speeding locomotive. And I think you'd never, you know, seen the world go by any faster than horseback, and suddenly you're flying down this track powered by steam. Every classroom teaches a different subject, but each earns credit towards your very own Palestine history diploma. And while some themes in here may be common, the individual stories are totally unique. Like the tale of this school's namesake, John H. Reagan. He was a U.S. congressman before and after the Civil War, along with being postmaster general of the Confederacy. Okay, so we're standing in Reagan High School. However, after John Reagan's house was torn down, this is now Reagan's living room, too. <laughs> Look, there's his old top hat, dining room table, organ, I guess. Reagan's best work came during Reconstruction as he helped pull Texas out of a dark time. And this museum definitely doesn't overlook the important contribution black Texans have had on this town. You know, in many ways, blacks experienced a very different city here in Palestine. But man, this room is just full of article after article that despite all the challenges, they still strive to make the city great. All right, looky here. Definitely Palestine's most famous athlete, Adrian Peterson. Born and raised here in Texas, but if you read the name on his jersey, something went terribly, terribly wrong. You know, in all my tripping, I've learned that what small hometown museums may lack in expensive displays, they often make up for in heart and moments of sheer, what the what? Is this a log cabin in the gym? Wow, I guess this whole thing was disassembled and then rebuilt here in the gym. A little bit different than being out on the prairie, but still pretty cool. This is like human-sized Legos right here. I gotta say, this feels like one of those high schools from the movies. You know the ones where everybody would just like break out and dance at any random moment?
You know, I think we all need to dance more in life. Let's sashay over to downtown, which confusingly here in Palestine, there are two of them. Sort of like you've got the square over here and then sort of the heart of town way over there. And in the middle of it is this district called Old Town. And the streets don't make any sense because you got the railroad tracks kind of through the middle and then they all go out like a spider web. It's more like just do whatever you want. I think it was like wagon trains and the streets just started cutting each other off at crazy angles. They're like, all right, well, let's just pave them. Sounds good to me. The only thing to do is jump in and start exploring. And in the Main Street District, you'll find a handful of unique shops, very cool old buildings, and a ton of history. But right behind this area, you'll find our destination for a historic lunch. This is the Hamburger Bar. And since 1942, it's been serving up tradition in the form of fresh beef sizzled up on a flat top and served on a toasty bun. This place is a throwback in the best of ways. The sign says since 1942. Hey, look around, it might as well still be 1942. The linoleum is peeling on the floor. Some of these stools are gone, and so right on top, they, they just put these old bar stools. I truthfully don't know how much longer this building's gonna stand up, but I tell you what, these cheeseburgers will never grow old. There's beauty in simplicity, and you definitely won't find any of those fancy big dollar big city burgers in here. Certainly not while Mary Beeson is in charge. There's been six owners. Wow. But it's never been closed. So one generation takes it from the next, takes yes. it from the next, and just keeps yes. going, huh? Uh huh. Right. So how long have you been at the helm? It'd be 34 years October. Oh, that's awesome. Now what, what called to you from this place that you should buy a, a burger joint like this? My husband retired from Halliburton and I had six kids and I just wanted to make a big pot of this, big pot of that. And that's the way I started. Instead of feeding your kids, you're yeah. feeding all of these kids, huh? Yeah. <laughs> that's good. Mary works hard to feed her extended family. You know, this place also makes a tasty plate lunch, but the burgers are too good to pass up. I asked Mary her secret, and she doesn't think she has one. Well, you only put four things on there. You don't let this tomatoes, pickles, and onions. It's not hard to mess up. But you'd be surprised how the people themselves want the hamburger change. The egg on it, or, you know. <laughs> you all the fancy things. cheeses yeah. and all that? It's fine with me. They'll say, I'll give you a hug if you put an egg on it. I'll go over there and get my hug and I'll put an egg on it. <laughs> Crazy young whippersnappers with their eggy burgers. But hey, that does sound pretty darn good. So it's time to belly up to the bar. Here it is. You come all the way to Palestine and eat at the hamburger bar, you better order a hamburger. Oh man, that is delicious in every way. That caught my taste buds off guard. I wasn't expecting that much flavor to be packed into it. And what better to put on the side than a hand battered onion ring? Truthfully, I bet a lot of people would drive by this place and think, no way I'm ever gonna go in there because it's a little bit of a dive. But oh man, the locals don't steer you wrong. Now, I know I threw a fried egg on top because, uh, well, that sounded delicious. But in a lot of ways, this is still just a classic cheeseburger in a classic place like this. That's, that's amazing. Mary, come here. I owe you a hug for that egg. Oh, right here. Oh, yeah. Now that's some love you can feel in both your heart and your stomach. We now interrupt this programming to remind you to like and subscribe. Now back to the road. Oh, I am stuffed. Well, you know, one of my favorite parts of East Texas is not the cities that sort of dot the landscape. It's the big, beautiful trees that are above it. And I've been told by some locals that there is a hidden waterfall out by Wolf Creek Park. So y'all up for a chasing a few waterfalls just like tlc taught me that's right baby. or didn't or, teach or didn't or didn't <laughs> let's yeah, find no. out <laughs> now palestine has many beautiful parks another great one is davy park visit during dogwood season and you'll learn why this town is so famous for its blooms but we're in search of something a bit different all right so if that's wolf creek lake it means the waterfall must be this way let's go come on this park includes the lake and a few miles of excellent trails, which I'm now seeing for the first time. Truthfully, I don't care if the waterfall is flowing or not, because hiking underneath these trees is reward enough. East Texas, where you can hike below 100 foot tall pine trees. Look at this one, monster. The joy is in the journey, right? Luckily, I think we found where we're supposed to be. Look at this. Oh, whoa, 
So this is where the dam pours over into Wolf Creek. And when this thing's flowing, it creates a big old waterfall. It probably drops 20, 25 feet down. This is cool. It's, the water has carved this grotto out of this uh, East Texas clay. I've got no doubt there have been some East Texas boys and girls who've jumped off of this thing. While it isn't flowing today, I can imagine it's a beautiful sight. Oh well, can't get lucky on every day trip. But any time outdoors is always time well spent. All right, so most folks when they think East Texas, they think, well, tall trees, down home, country stuff. Well, what if I told you you should think science, cosmos, outer space? I'd say, show me. <laughs> That's what I'm about to do. <laughs> That's right, folks, because hidden here in the woods is NASA's super secret base, the Columbia Scientific Balloon Facility. Okay, it's not really secret, just not really well known. Okay, guys, we're going to NASA. Not the NASA you're thinking, but these guys still launch things into space. Not shuttles, balloons. Luckily, they do offer tours, and this is our guide, Mona. We're about the best kept secret in not only Palestine, but in Texas. Well, sorry, but the secret might get out a little bit. I hope so. <laughs> now this place may look quaint, but these nondescript metal buildings house some of the highest science in the world. So what is a scientific balloon exactly? It's a 1,000 foot apparatus using a helium balloon at the top to carry a payload of cutting edge research dangling below. This facility handles 15 to 20 launches a year all over the world, including here on site. We're coming up to the launch pad. The pad is 1,000 feet in diameter and the, the launch vehicle usually gets in the center of the pad. Yep. And then they lay the balloon out and uh, Hopefully the wind works with us and we get to launch. This crew is loading up for a launch in Antarctica. But regardless of where it happens, New Mexico, Australia, or even the South Pole, all the prep and monitoring happens here. This is our operations control center. Oh, cool. Yeah. Houston, we do not have a problem. <laughs> we are in full control. Now, while these balloons do rely on the wind, with predictable weather patterns, scientists have gotten really good at knowing how a balloon will act at over 100,000 feet in altitude. And up there, they can do all sorts of research. Cosmic ray, gamma ray, we have a payload who is here. They're looking for neutrinos, which What's are- a neutrino? They're little- oh, Come on, Chet, you don't know about neutrinos? <laughs> well, I, I think, I think. They're small, they're fuzzy, extraterrestrial. Yes. They... Well, they are extraterrestrial. Okay, I guess so. I don't know if they're fuzzy. <laughs> So I have to ask, and we can cut the camera if we have to, but which, which one of these monitors the aliens? The ones back here. <laughs> I knew it! I knew it! It says aliens exist! This is much more serious science than UFOs. The buildings here are full of some of the smartest people on Earth. But before any of their experiments can go up there, well, they must be rigorously tested down here. And this is the staging area for the brains of the balloon. So this is a piece of a payload that they're testing to make sure it can withstand, you know, the, the, the lack of pressure up at the top of the atmosphere, the temperatures up at the top of the atmosphere. This definitely ain't your uh, go-kart motor, you know? <laughs> This is crazy. And of course, tape. Because when you're sending something up 100,000 feet in the air, you need plenty of tape, especially duct tape. Hey, man. A lot <laughs> of ducting. Yeah, that's right, man. Spatial ducting. And if the operation here builds the brains, well, this next building is the brawn. These are upper and lower parachute fittings. Oh, wow. Cool. What's this sitting over in this table? This is balloon film. So this is what our is NASA layer. scientific balloons are made of. Yes, sir. One step above saran wrap. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Grab this, okay. hang on to that, and I'll pull on this. Okay. All right. And it stretches, yeah. but, it, but it won't tear. Wow, that's So it important. has some give. So if I get this right, you got balloon up top, it's connected to the parachute. Right. Parachute goes down to some rigging. Rigging then goes to the payload. Right. And that whole thing goes up. Right. Scientific experiments are over. Pop your balloon, this disappears. Payload, parachute, come back down. Right. Ha, I've learned something today. <laughs> You're good. Yeah. Now, now, now let's go try your own, Chet. All right, yeah. Let's, let's just start <laughs> making scientific balloons. Yes, absolutely. And finally, when it's time to launch, 
they have to call in the big muscle. Tiny Tim! It's amazing to find a place doing such world-class research with so little fanfare. I guess with no loud rockets going boom to get our attention, we simply don't notice. But just like these balloons drift silently through the stratosphere, this facility quietly accomplishes mission after mission from right here in Texas. All right, guys, I think it's time to come down from the clouds and mix it up with the ground-level people of Palestine. So let's visit the newest kid in town who lives on the oldest block. So we're back in Old Town, which might be my favorite part of town. I really dig sort of the, uh, the industrial buildings, you know, like, like this one, the old sheet metal. Like, look, this one runs, you know, over the creek. And it was actually this creek not too long ago that flooded out all these businesses, including the one we're about to go to for dinner. But oh man, have they come back in a big way. This is Pint and Barrel Draft House, bringing a crafty experience that most would only expect in a big city. You know, it didn't take long for this place to become Palestine's most popular neighborhood pub that's fit for the whole family. The beer is certainly a big part of the pub, but even bigger is the pub grub. And this is owner Chris Keller. And so what did, what did you order for us here? Uh, that's the uh, barbecue bacon cheddar fries topped off with the pulled pork. Oh, dude, that pork is awesome. Oh, yeah, the pork is delicious. So how, how did this place get started? I was a brewer over at St. Arnold, a particularly really rough day at the brewery, and I got texted a picture of this building, and I remember going, don't these people know that I'm having a rough day? Why are they texting me in the middle of this? And I look at yeah. this, and they're like, hey, Chris, want to put a pub here? And I'm like, yeah. Oh, Why that's... is it not a pub now? <laughs> I've seen people that have lived in this town their whole lives, they, they go decades without seeing people, and then they come in here and they're like, I haven't seen you in 20 years. This is amazing. Where have you been? I've, I've been here. <laughs> here. Right. Amazing what good food and good beer can do for it the is. community. But it wasn't long after Pint and Barrel was up on its feet that a flood came through and knocked it down. And that's when Chris realized what this place means to these people. I, I didn't call you. anybody. I wow. came up here and people were people started showing up. It must have been 200 people from town. You know, people that love this place. They came in here to help us. We got a week's worth of work done one day. That, oh, because, wow. I mean, yeah, with that's that, so many people. With, like how, I don't know how to thank you people. Yeah, I don't know how yeah, to yeah. thank any of you. And they're like, get back open. <laughs> that's how you thank us. That's great, man. Congratulations. Thanks, brother. Well, now comes the inescapable question. What do I get for dinner? Well, it can be nothing but the three little piggy. Piggy one, pulled pork. Piggy two, fried spam. Piggy three, bacon. Oh, and I guess piggy four, me, the guy who's gonna try to eat it. <laughs> All right, look at this oinker. Like a pound and a half of pulled pork on this thing. All right, here we go. Ah, I really good. The proof is on my face. What oh. a slob! Oh yeah. Would you call me a pig? I would. Pickles, pork, bacon, and then to top it off, spam. I mean, who doesn't love a good slab of fried spam? I mean, I'd be happy with this pulled pork alone on a sandwich. But you know, if it's already in the kitchen, why not add spam and bacon? It only makes sense. You know, I really do admire a place like this. You know, bringing a, a new, fresh concept to an old town. Look around. I mean, it's pretty clear to see that the uh, community has embraced Pint and Barrel. And one bite, very easy to understand why. Oh, that's good. Spam. You know, I guess it's only appropriate that we're eating pork to set up our last ride of the day. You see, out here in East Texas, wild hogs are a real problem, especially for farmers. And we're meeting up with local guide Brian Bedrape to do our part in fixing that problem. Brian? Hey. How are you, sir? Pretty good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Man, it's a hot night to be hunting hogs, but oh, I guess yeah. that's, that's what they like, huh? They should be on their feet because they lay up all during the day and then it actually cools down a little bit at night. All right, so night vision? Like, seriously, this is uh, like tactical Navy SEAL stuff, huh? Gen 3 night vision and some of the best thermal that civilians can get. So. Okay, so we're on a farmer's land who's who, who needs these things cleared, right? Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Henson here, he raises 
everything from onions to watermelons and the hogs are just devastating this crop. So he's asked us to come out here and uh, help him and then we take the meat if the hunters don't want them and give them to the people that need the meat. So everyone, cool. everyone benefits. Yeah, all right, just not the hog, but that's okay. <laughs> Now, as you know, hunting animals is not something we normally do on this show, but it is important for land management, which is critical in Texas. And folks really do travel from all over the world just to hog hunt here. What Brian's done is he's baited about 50 different places across this ranch. He's been keeping a pretty close eye on these hogs, so he knows they use them. It's just a matter of uh, what time. Are they there right now? Or are they gonna be there in a few hours? And so what we're gonna do is drive around um, check a bunch of different bait stations. Now this night vision is something crazy. So we're sitting in the back of the truck and with the spotter's help seeing all sorts of things. It's a couple of deer shit. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the clarity on this scope is just so much, so much better than the one on the screen there. Yeah. So a lot of times I'll stop and double check, see what's out there. Uh, but there's two deer in the coon, so let's keep moving. Yeah. You know, if we were just out here for wildlife viewing, it would be pretty fun. We've been seeing all kinds of different stuff. There's like, well, of course, deer, coyotes even. Whoa, whoa. Seen some rabbits, some possums. Chet, look, look. What's that? Oh my gosh, you missed it. Chet, there was something. It just walked. Daniel, dude, there's nothing there. Uh, nobody saw that. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> it's late, man. You're imagining things. All right. Hey, maybe cool. so. Cool. I think my crew might be going crazy out here in the dark which is pretty easy to do as we endlessly watch the roads and the monitors, but then. Chet, that's a hog. All right, this is go time. Yeah, you wanna be real quiet, cause they will hear us. All right. We can't drive any closer. Okay. Right? So we're on foot from here. All right. All right, just follow me. The stalking begins. Sure enough, as we pace through the dark, we set our sights on the culprits of total farm destruction. Oh yeah, whenever you're ready. Oh, here we go. Stay on him, you got him. You got him, Chad. Got him, baby. Oh man, congratulations. Hey, thanks, brother. Oh, he's big. That's yeah. a good haul. <laughs> man, my heart's still pounding. <laughs> good deal, man. So this will, one, get him off the land and then fill some people's bellies yeah, too. A huh? hog of this size, you'd be surprised how many watermelons he'd go through in one night. First hog, you say? That's right. That's the first one. Well, congratulations. At night, nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a day. Who knew an East Texas town could be so down home and sky high all at the same time? There's history, beauty, and great grub all in one place. Pronounce it Steen or Stein all you want. It don't matter. Just make sure this town is your day trip destination. All right, Chet. Let's go find you another monster. Sounds good to me, man. Okay, guys. Well, I'll see all y'all out on the road. Bye, con Dios, amigos. What? Oh, oh, ah, oh, big butt. So one very interesting thing about Palestine is that the square, which is usually the heart of the town in East Texas, is actually different. Like, wait, different from what? I don't know, Chet. <laughs> Who are we talking to? What are we talking about? We're on a, we're on a date. We're on a date here at the hamburger bar. I don't know how that guy feels about it, though. He's giving, he's giving me the look. <laughs> hey! There's hay! Hey, oh, you, you didn't hey, for there, it. I did! Oh, you did? There's hay! Oh. Hey! Have you ever thought about holding on to one of these weather balloons and just kind of seeing if you can hide? Just like, hold on. Vaya con Dios, amigos. Whoa. Chet, Chet. What? Ah! Ah! <laughs> Squatch! Ah! Squatch! <laughs> Get out of here, Squatchy! He's gonna overheat in that suit. He is, man. Howdy, y'all. Follow along with my adventures at Chet Tripper on Instagram and at the Day Tripper TV on Facebook and YouTube. Or head to thedaytripper.com for travel guides, past episodes, and info on our mobile app and Team Day Tripper. This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. Howdy y'all, Chet the Day Tripper here. Thanks so much for tripping with us. Uh, remember, while you're here, like this video, subscribe to our channel so that we can stay out there on the road and keep on tripping. Did we miss anything in this town? Leave us a comment, let us know. We love finding out about new stops with all of your tips 
And if you love Epic Texas Day Trips, remember to check our channel. We got a lot of them on there. Also, don't forget, if you want some sweet Day Tripper merch or another cool Texas made product, come see us in Georgetown at the Day Tripper World Headquarters. You can also shop online if you check the link down there in the caption. All right, y'all. Bye, con Dios, amigas.